Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. And I want to thank my listeners in Sydney, Australia, for joining that mission today. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guests, Chris Kendall. Chris, are you ready to join the mission? Yes, I am. Let's bring it. Yeah, I'm excited to get you on. I'm particularly interested in your business. So I, I look forward to learning more. So let me introduce you to the audience. Chris is the CEO of Australian outsourced accounting groups, Eritex, helping businesses to grow and scale with best practice accounting and bookkeeping and real time access to accurate financial information. He's also the host of the Anti-Failure Podcast. Go and check it out. I've been listening to his episodes there and uh, he's examining the lessons from failure in business and life that ultimately allows us to succeed. So we're on the same wavelength, Chris. Chris, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for having me along, Andrew. It's good to speak to you. Um, the, the idea behind Aerotex came from a career spent in CFO and financial services for small and big businesses. And I wanted to bring uh, a, a model that would disrupt the way traditional bookkeeping and operational accounting was delivered. There was a time when Zero had um, entered the market in a big way. It gave the promise of real-time information, but uh, that that access to that information was limited by the bookkeepers who could deliver the work. So I've got a, a, a lot of experience in shared services, and I've also had a lot of experience in the Philippines. And uh, I teamed up with a, a former uh, colleague of mine, and we created Aritex. Um, we're now 450 clients, working with 220 employees, uh, and delivering uh, accurate financial information and data analysis to our clients. That's amazing. Um, and for those people that don't know, Zero, you're talking about is X E R O. Yes, correct. And, and I believe was it originally from Australia? New Zealand. New Zealand. Started okay. in New Zealand. Yep. And I can say that from my experience dealing with accounting and finance in my own businesses and with my clients, uh, Zero has you know it was a game changer when it came out because it really started to think about it from the perspective of a you know a true cloud-based accounting system that was yes. also not overly complicated so you know we use zero for some of our clients we use zero for our own business so if those people out there who are not who are looking for an accounting software uh, the one problem i've found with zero that i i haven't been able to fully resolve is that if it's a a manufacturing process with bills of materials and all that yes uh, it, I generally have had to go to another software, though they may have components now in Zero that can handle that. What, what is your experience with with a, a manufacturer? Yeah, so uh, I, I would describe Zero as a business platform. It's not an accounting platform. Uh, it's it's intended to drive information back to small business owners in that uh, small to medium space, uh, make it easy for advisors and businesses and accountants to share information in a single ledger, but it's really not a, a fully baked accounting system or what we would traditionally call a, a, an ERP system that handles manufacturing, handles inventory, and natively handles all of the controls that you would expect with an accounting system. And what they've done is develop an ecosystem of apps that sit outside of Zero and connect through open APIs to be able to communicate between uh, an inventory app or a payroll app or a um, any of the number of uh, point of sale apps or payment platforms so that you have an integrated app stack uh, that ultimately feeds through to zero as your source of financial truth. Mm. And is there is there a, a good app for a manufacturing company or is that something, how do you handle a, a client that is manufacturing? Yeah, we have a number of clients that are using Deere. Um, I think it's SIN7 now, they've changed the name, but that basically allows you to build, build the bill of materials you mentioned, uh, create the inventory items, and it automatically integrates to zero. So, uh, but th there's a whole number of them out there that, that are industry specific, 
What's that like name? Many what's, softwares. The name of that? what's the name of that one you just mentioned? So it started its life as Deer Systems, D-E-A-R, uh, but it's been rebranded to SIN7, C-I-N-7. Um, and, and like many software applications, they are 90% good, but the 10% forces businesses to change the way they behave in order to meet or put up with workarounds or, or things that aren't quite fully baked. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I'm just curious, how do you handle, I mean, I, I'm interested in your business just because I do some limited outsource CFO business compared yep. to what you're doing. Um, how do you handle, like, let's just imagine now that we've got a listener that has a, a business, they have a factory, they have a trading business, they have a service business, and mm -hmm. they need help. You yeah. know, they know their accounting is kind of, you know, out of control. And they're not, obviously, they're not in Sydney, let's say. They're in uh, yeah. Mumbai. They're in, you know, London. They're in Bangkok. And yeah. how do you work with them? Like, wh where is their first interface with you? They're coming to your website? Or where do they first interface with you? And then how do you work with these guys? Yeah, so I think if we break it down into the three common components of any outsourcing or external expertise that you gain from people who have experience or, or other advantages that they can offer you. There's outsourcing, and that's basically taking a task or a specific project out to a, a, a business or um, an individual who has expertise that you don't necessarily have internal. You might not need a full time. Uh, you go out and you find somebody project specific, task driven. That's what we call outsourcing. Then you've got offshoring, which is taking the task or the opportunity to uh, a different cost structure uh, or, or, an, or access to different talent pools that you don't have available locally. And then you have what we, we call managed services, where we, we take the problem from the client and we solve it. So let me give you an example. We, we call it operational accounting. Operational accounting in our world starts from the point of data entry and goes all the way through to the point of reconciling a trial balance and understanding the key drivers in the business so that we can prepare accurate financial reports. So we combine a lot of people, process, and technology to get from the point of data entry through to the point of financial information. And essentially, we're an outsourced accounting department in that application of our services. Another example might be that we have a technology that is specific to an industry. We build the expertise that sits around that technology so that we can take it out to a broader set of clients and say, all right, we can make it efficient using the technology. We can make it even more efficient by using trained professionals uh, who then deliver you a solution. And so you're getting a combination of people, process, and, and technology to get to an outcome. Mm. So... Often what happens when a, when a software technology comes to market, the client may not have the necessary expertise within the business to understand how to leverage that technology investment. So what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll make the technology work for its intended purpose. So you get a combination of skilled experience with the technology delivering you an efficient outcome. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is kind of end to end from the bookkeeping aspect trial balance, but you, beyond financial statement, financial information, you know, like for instance, the idea of, you know, what's the gross margin of your various products? So where do you need mm -hmm. to adjust pricing? You know, that type of thing. Yep. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And I, I think um, the key differentiator for us is that if something goes wrong, my clients pick up the phone and call Chris Kendall and say, fix the problem. I've got an issue. You figure out how to fix it. And so we, we put together the solution and we come back. And one of my questions is how do you manage, let's say, um, you know, you've got your workforce, they've got yep. their, your clients have their workforce and you're, you're probably being brought on, not because their workforce is amazing and they want to outsource that, but probably because mm -hmm. their, their workforce is struggling with getting the accounting and the finance right. So yes. the first initial period that you have is this onboarding where you're trying mm -hmm. to figure out their systems. You're trying to get, you're trying to maybe redesign some of their flows of how they're keeping data, bookkeeping and all the information so that it mm -hmm. feeds into what you need. 
how do you manage that? That seems like that's a hard thing to do remotely. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. The first is that I was lucky enough to team up with a very smart operational uh, delivery person, Chris Corpus. He runs our operations in the Philippines. And Chris has a unique ability to distill down the business requirements into a delivery platform. So he uses a combination of a, a business process outsourcing approach to build a shared services team. My role in this engagement is to understand the business context. And because I've worked in small business, big business, uh, and in a, a number of different industries, I can pretty quickly identify the, the elements of the business context that are important that Chris then translate into operational delivery. So all of our team in the Philippines are set up in a BPO structure. We have a director of ops, who is Chris, and then we have team leads who are all responsible for different portfolios of clients. And we try to align those, uh, those client opportunities with the skills and experience that we have on the team. And so the team leaders are responsible for day-to-day -day delivery of their portfolio. They're supported by a senior accountant, a junior accountant, in some cases interns, in some cases accounts payable, but they're all working together as a dedicated resource to that client delivery. So over time, the client gets to understand them and their capabilities and get to know them as humans. And over time, we get to know the client business. So by bringing a combination, again, of people, process and technology, we document what's important in the client context of that specific engagement. And then we use our methodology and our infrastructure to be able to deliver it consistently and accurately. The second thing is uh, COVID was devastating for many, but in our world, it taught uh, businesses that the opportunity to outsource offshore or get managed services is possible in a remote way. So a lot of resistance in the early years, I've been doing this 10 years now, and um, we, we, we met a lot of resistance about the offshoring element. Oh, I need somebody on site because you know, I need to explain the invoice or I need to explain the revenue or whatever it is. Well, COVID taught us that we actually don't need to for this delivery of this, the type of work we're talking about. It can be done remotely. And what sets us up as a, uh, for success is making sure that our people have the infrastructure and the methodologies and the process documentation in order to deliver what we're, what we're working to give our clients, which is accurate information. Mm. And... <clears throat> So let's uh, let's just one other thing I'd love to understand is like what's the ideal business for you, and what are the types of business that you know don't work for you, and I believe most of your clients are in Australia, if I'm yep. correct, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have we have several clients in different parts of the world, <laughs> but primarily here in Australia, uh, our sweet spot really is is the small to medium. Um, we have seen uh, an increase in demand for augmented accounting departments where they come to us and say, I've got internal expertise in maybe a financial controller role or a CFO role, but I can't find access or I don't have access to local resources for whatever reasons. Um, and can you build an accounting department for me that serves as part of our team to give a, the business the information that it needs? Uh, so it's, that's that's how we we work in an augmented accounting department, uh, and we could have upwards of seven or eight people sitting there doing all sorts of uh, internal AR, AP, GL, uh, or whatever it is that they need, or a traditional accounting department would deliver. And then we uh, we start with very small businesses in hospitality. Um, you know, it's uh, I'm very passionate about small business, so I, I'll always look at an opportunity where I have um, have a passion that can help them be better in the way that, or free up their time so that they can focus on the things they want to do in their business. And in, uh, I don't know about Australia, but in Thailand, the mm -hmm. accounting and let's say bookkeeping slash accounting services have been commoditized mm -hmm. and prices have been pushed down and it's like the first question I ask people when I talk to them is like, how much are you paying for your accounting? 
And they say, you know, well, I'm paying 500 bucks a month or whatever, even Mm -hmm. less. And I'm like, okay, so what are you expecting to get from that? Yeah. And, you know, in the end, people don't realize that whether that's sales or marketing or operations, you want good, you know, you want good service. It, It costs money. I'm just curious, you know, what's happening with pricing and how do you remain competitive? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, globalization has uh, hastened the speed to low cost. So you can go out and find yourself uh, a bookkeeper um, who will work, I, I don't know, pick a number, $5 an hour, $10 an hour. But in that in that delivery model, you're responsible for all of the risk associated with it. So you get a warm body who has a set of skills, may or may not be competent. You don't know until you engage. And then after spending six months or 12 months training them and getting them up to speed, they say, thank you very much, and I've moved on. And you're starting over. So when you engage in a firm like Aritex, what you're getting is our methodology. You're getting the director of operations. You're getting a quality team. You're getting a team lead. You're getting redundancy. You don't have a single point of failure anymore. Whereas if you go direct and go for the cheap option, and the, well, let's call it inexpensive rather than cheap, but if you go for the inexpensive option, you've got other costs that you're going to incur as a result of taking that option. And what we pitch to our clients is you get, we remove the single point of failure, we give you level of skill experience and people who match your requirements. And when we make mistakes, we document what happened and we understand it. And 99.9% of the time, it's a process failure rather than people failure. And we fix the process and we keep moving on. So clients who understand that delivery model and that we're actually part of the business that is going to market are the ones that we we are most successful with. And my last question about, you know, I, I say I find your business interesting and particularly the advanced way that you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, my other question is, what's the promise? In other words, let's say, you know, it's going to take us X number of months, but by the time yeah. we're done with this and we get to this point, here's what you're going to be able to do that you couldn't do in the past. Yeah. And that's going to make a difference for your business. I'll answer that by saying the traditional model for bookkeeping and accounting was compliance driven. It was to get to a tax return or it was to get to uh, here in Australia, a a business activity statement, which is the the reporting of GST. It wasn't about information and the concept of uh, compliance driven bookkeeping is that it is um, done on the bookkeepers terms. When can they get to the office? rather than when do I need the information. Mm. Um, And so what you get with us is a dedicated team of people who give their best every single day to give you the information you need to run your business. So we can turn the paradigm and say, right, if we get the data entry right and we've got all the disciplines and the reconciliations and the work that we do around that data entry, then compliance is a push of a button. And we should never have to add a fee to process a tax return. And if we we don't do tax in our business, Mm. but we can take what we've got pre-processed, fully supported with documentation. So we've got a single source of truth in zero with all of the documentation attached so that if there is any audit or if there is any compliance matter, you've got all the information in a single point, a single place. Mm. So... We'll bring the process, we'll bring the discipline, we'll bring the the people to make sure that you've got fully compliant financial records in your accounting system of choice. 95% of our clients are using zero. Mm. Fantastic. Well, it's great to learn about what you're doing and, you know, it's so valuable. I think when I started my own, one of my businesses is a factory, you know, we really struggled to get the accounting and that was 30 years ago and all the old software that we had to use, yeah. and, you know, I just yeah. nightmare. And of course, nothing could be downloaded out of it. And, you know, there was no API connection or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, you could only key it into one computer and all of that. And, and then swapping data files around <laughs> and then someone will have done something in one file that isn't replicated. No, it was, 
I remember in one of my first audits, I turned up to a client and I said, uh, you know, the checklist asked me to ask you, what is the accounting software? And they said, mind your own business. And I said, no, well, that's not the right answer. I really need to know what. <laughs> so early days of auditing. <laughs> Yes. And some people out there may not even know that there was an accounting software called mind your own business. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, Things was, have come uh, a long way. They definitely have. And I think one of the yeah. lessons that I've learned here in Thailand is that, you know, I work a lot with mid-sized family businesses and, you know, friends yeah. and other people. And what I see is that, you know, I, I wrote down something that you said that I, I, I haven't really been able to articulate it as well as what you just said, which is compliance driven bookkeeping. And mm. really it's tax compliance driven bookkeeping that they're yep. focused on. And, you know, and you, 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 you once your business starts to scale, mm -hmm. it's very hard to make decisions without good accounting data. Yeah. And I have, and so a, that's my, I've spent my year, years as a CFO with small and big businesses. And what we, the key is to make sure you understand the drivers in the business and you know how you're performing against them. And when it's compliance driven, you just want to check in the box for the tax return. But how can you course correct if you don't have information at your fingertips? Yeah. When I, my career, I started as a financial analyst in the stock market here. And I did that job, mm -hmm. you know, all of my life, basically. And what I explained to young people in particular is I said, as a financial analyst, most 99% of financial analysts never look below the audited financial statements. Mm -hmm. And the- yep auditors and the accountants never look beyond the financial statements. And so it's like this, it's an event horizon, you know, <laughs> one hands off to another. And when I had, when I was an analyst, you know, since 1993 and I had my business, which we were setting up in Thailand. So my best friend was running it and then I was working on it in the evenings and on the weekends, you know, mm -hmm. trying to fix the accounting and the finance and all that stuff. All of a sudden I realized this whole ecosystem below the audited financial statements and all that can go wrong and all the the issues of that. And it, it really made me a much better analyst to understand. And I, I really advise everybody out there, a lot of business owners and business leaders put aside accounting. I was in a meeting with some a client of mine and one of the members of the family said, uh, I, I don't know finance. I give that to someone else, you know, and yeah. I say, you can't make a great financially great company if you don't pay attention to finance you know for sure and i think you could also extend that application to the number of examples we have where financials have been audited but the actual underlying business is fundamentally flawed and fails totally yeah in fact i just <laughs> I just had a, a a person i was talking to who said they they had a big four accounting they hired a big mm -hmm. four accounting service to come in and audit their books and it would cost a lot of money and they they didn't know much about their accounting and after four years of the them auditing the books in the fourth year the big four firms said to them uh we made a mistake in the calculation of your cost mm -hmm. of goods sold and the margins not this and that and you know and yeah. it, it just goes to show that you know even when you go out to the big guys in mm -hmm. fact they probably have less attention you know, to put on a medium sized company to fix it. And a lot of, there's not a lot of places to go, you know, I need help no. with accounting and I need to run my business. I do not have time. And you think you're going to go to a big four and they're just not going to be able to buy the resources, but they will mm -hmm. charge the price. Of course. Yep. Exciting. Well, um, it's a great intro to you and your business, but now it's time yeah, to share you. your worst investment ever. And since no one <laughs> goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah, well, I was thinking about this as I was heading in here today and um, I'm pretty conservative. Uh, I'm an accountant. I've been trained uh, on on debits and credits and and the application of those principles in uh, different business environments. I think my worst investment is the one I didn't make. And that was buying property back in the nineties before I left Australia. Um, and if I had my time again, and my advice to anybody out there is find a way to get into the property market as early in life as you can go through the struggle strains of pulling together, uh, all of the resources that you've got access to and put it in property. Um, most of my financial successes have been in property. Um, so 
uh, I wish I had done it earlier. One one investment I made uh, was one through passion and and uh, emotional attachment. It was into a reality TV show that was being um, uh, piloted uh, around uh, finding baseball players. It was out of Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a friend of mine who was uh, who who had this idea called up at bat and a shout out to Dave Chamberlain, still a very good mate of mine. And, and mm. he had this vision for creating a reality show that was intended to describe the way professional athletes uh, put through the ringers to determine where they end up playing a professional sport. And what he wanted to do was create a whole reality TV program. And he had some of the big names in baseball. And It's a brilliant and, idea. Yeah. Um, and so he needed some money to uh, to make the pilot. Um, and friends and family, often the, the access of capital when you've got an idea that you want to try and test out. So uh, we all put some money in and, and we gave it a great shot. But we couldn't get the traction to turn it into the TV show that we, we all thought it was capable of. And I, I, it's not what I would describe as my worst investment ever. Uh, I think... Um, the, the, the differentiator was it was a friend of mine. I believed in him. I believed in his vision. And I thought, why not? Let's have a go. And I think the lesson out of it probably is that I should have thought more about the financials and how are we going to turn this into a model that makes money for everybody. And because I was caught up in the emotional attachment to David and, and his idea, um, didn't really put it through any sort of due diligence. We had a great time. We turned up. We we did the filming of the pilot. We met some great people. Um, I was pretty proud of it, but we just couldn't really get it off and running. It's very competitive and difficult market in the US to do something like that. Mm. So how would you describe the lessons that you've learned from what you've shared? Yeah, I think it's um, so the application of those principles. Um, when I'm looking at property, is it something that appeals to me? Is it something that I think there's either, does it meet my immediate needs? And then is there an opportunity to leverage that in a growing market? And we've been very fortunate here in Australia with a very uh, hot real estate market. So a lot of people making money out of real estate. A long but, burning. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's burn. the, yeah, it's the, uh, it's the application of principles to, um, you know, it, it's not just a case of buying property. It's buying property in a market that's changing or is it the trying to figure out where are the down markets and what are the what are the investments being made around that community? Um, but I really just, you know, my wife and I have I've been lucky in the way that we've identified property, found a way to get in, and then through no real effort on our own, we've just we've just been able to take opportunity in in those markets mm, great um <clears throat> there's a couple of things that i would share um from listening to what you've said and i want to talk about the second story just because it hits home mm -hmm. and it actually mm -hmm. what was my worst investment ever which was investing in a a, a good friend who i trusted and mm -hmm. still trust and like um and his idea which was you know it was related to language learning and he was developing, uh, he was, you know, a real savant in that area. And mm -hmm. so he was developing software to, to improve that. Mm -hmm. And, but what, what ended up happening was that what I es underestimated and I felt it when I heard your story, what I underestimated was the funding needed to go big time. Yes. And, you know, at some point you've got to move from your garage Mm -hmm. to the big time yeah if you're going to really make it and make it successful you know and and what happened was once we got to that point mm -hmm. i realized i mean i can go out and raise money but i wasn't convinced that we were going to be able if i could raise five million bucks to do the necessary marketing that needed to be done to compete in the big leagues yeah. i also wasn't convinced that he was going to be able to deliver on that and so it just kind of got to this, like there's just a, a, a breaking point where you've it's 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 go, no go. 
Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what your story reminded me of is that we just hit that point and it was an obvious no go, even though it was a good idea. He was a good person. It was, you know, mm -hmm. we were trying our best. So that that's what um that I'm I'm thinking about. Any, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I think it's an interesting dilemma in in that uh, I've been very lucky to work with some early stage companies in both medical device and technology. Uh, and in those environments, there's a balance between raising enough money to reduce dilution, but raising enough money to make sure you can get to the next hurdle. And often the, the discrepancy between founder valuations and willingness to take dilution and the professional investors' willingness to put money in, that's a very wide gap. And so you find a compromise. And often, neither are right. The small amount, if you could, if you are willing to give up more dilution, you can have a smaller piece of a much bigger pie. And the same thing with the VC or the, the professional investor is, if they give enough money to the business to allow it to get to success, then everybody wins. Mm. But the dynamics of that relationship in, in, in raising professional funding means that it's often compromised on both sides of the equation. Each putting in a minimum. Yes. Like pushing towards try, their their ultimate goal is to kind of give away the minimum amount of this company. And yes. the other side is to give away the minimum amount of capital to make this work. And then, and then you've got all the sorts of different conflicting agenda that comes with professional money being managed or, or uh, used in a way that is very different to a founder passion-led business. And so the conflict and how do you resolve that conflict? And I've, I've sat on both sides of that. Mm. And, and that's a very painful process for founders to go through and for professional investors to go through. But, but this idea that a business has this uh, requirement to get to success and, and predicting what that looks like with imperfect information is very difficult, right? But we put together business plans. We put together timeframes. I mean, David had a, a full business model on how much money he was going to need in order to take the pilot to the show and then what was production going to look. But it was all uncertain information. Mm. And so as you unfold that investment trajectory, you start to, oh, gather more information. And actually what I thought was going to cost 10 grand is going to cost me 30 grand. Not because I'm doing it poorly, but because I didn't understand the full requirements at the time I put together the business plan. So you go out, you raise 50,000 from friends and family. You then get into the experience of that investment process and you find out actually there's a few things you hadn't thought about. And now you need 150,000 to take that out and find the next 100,000 becomes very painful. Mm. All right. So and they... through no fault of anybody, right? Yeah. It's just that. We have imperfect information at the time we look to raise money and then the plans to execute those those uh, strategies get derailed. And so how much how much dry powder do I have in my, my backpack that will help me get through the bottleneck <laughs> and to the next point of funding where I can demonstrate actually uh, the milestones are there, it just cost me a little, little bit more. Yeah, and unfortunately, we can't live life, life in reverse because then we know the outcomes, but you know, we have to live yeah. it with with that imperfect information. And then you look back in hindsight, and and it's it's easy to to to, you know, I, I've interviewed almost eight hundred people now on their worst investment ever, ever and it's it's easy right. to go back and and beat yourself for that. But you have mm -hmm. to remember that I was making the best decisions I could with the information and knowledge I had at the time. So. I think yep. that's a it's it's a great reminder. And I don't think there's any one person that I can think of is an example of making the best investment the first time. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't exist, right? So we're all and that's the that's the concept behind my anti-failure podcast is talking about those missteps or those if we loosely call it failures. Mm. What happened? What were the circumstances around that? And then what did you do differently as a result of that? And there's something about small business owners who have this courage or this resilience or this determination that despite the failure, I was talking with someone on my podcast recently, she would created a new product out of chickpeas for people who were allergic to peanuts. Her entire first shipment was spoiled. Everything she had built 
to this point in time came in a box from her supplier overseas and it was all spoiled. That, that would destroy many people, but for her, it gave her more determination. Once she got through the shock of unpacking this box, she was then determined even more so to find a way to get product that she could get to market. And now she's got a great distribution business mm. and she's solving her mission, which is to bring a healthy product to market. So I think <clears throat> that, that for me is where I get my passion for small business owners, the courage, the resilience, the determination that in despite or in the face of failure, they find a way to take one more step and move on to success. Yeah, it's such a great, you know, great uh, concept. I was just thinking about, I, I'm kind of a U.S. Civil War buff and um, mm -hmm. Ulysses S. Grant and uh, and William Tecumseh Sherman were quite a pair from the Union mm -hmm. side. And they, there was a battle at Shiloh. Uh, and this battle, basically on the first day, the Union Army just didn't have enough men on the field and the Confederate army woke up early in the morning and attacked them aggressively and they pushed them back and it was raining and they pushed them back hard and far until, you know, it was a disaster. And in fact, Grant wasn't even on the scene. And so he had to get on a boat, get down there and he arrives mm -hmm. late in the day. And <clears throat> Grant knew one thing that the other generals that were fighting all day didn't know was that he had reinforcements coming that were right. marching and mm -hmm. he knew the timing based upon the information he could get that they would arrive in the evening and be ready to fight the next morning. And so yeah. it was, it was rain, it rained all night that night and Grant <laughs> slept under a tree, like in a hammock. I mean, everybody was wet and, every, yeah. and it was a yeah. disaster. And, and uh, Sherman went to Grant and Grant was, you know, smoking his typical cigar. And he said, it was the devil's own day is what Sherman said to Grant. And Grant mm -hmm. famously said, we'll lick him in the morning. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, the resilience. So, right. Absolutely. And and that's what I'm passionate about in, tell, in telling those small business owner stories, because I think it takes enormous courage. And I'm so, interested in, in 800 interviews. Have you found a common theme so that I can avoid making a bad investment? Well, I think there are some common themes, you know, that I've seen and, you know, one of them, the first one that's the most common is that people fail to do any research. Mm -hmm. yep. And I would say that is the absolute common theme. Yeah. Uh, and then I would say that the second one is that people are driven by emotion mm -hmm. and that yep. causes them to, you know, to, to, to make mistakes. And then the, the third one is what I would say is, you know, um, the faulty logic or reasoning mm -hmm. process. You know, those are some of the most common ones that I've seen. And yeah. I'm, I'm interested. Do you see that uh, I've seen on a, a few examples where people are not willing to make the hard decision soon enough? So they know they're on a bad ride and they keep trying to either kid themselves or holding on to the original without being able to pivot and course correct. You see, I mean, it, we talk a lot in, in our podcast about, you know, if, you've got, if you're going to fail, fail quick. Be honest about the failure. Figure out what happened and then move on to the next step. Do you see that making those decisions uh, on, on bad investment strategies are delayed? Totally delayed. Yeah. They they get stuck in a rut and they can't get themselves out. Yep. And they don't, you know, the other thing is that people um, didn't plan for failure also. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, my expertise is also in the area of investing. And I know that for a lot of the investors that I got on, um, you know, they had no, no plan for what mm -hmm. if this stock goes down? What do I do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No plan for that. Yeah, right. And and it, yeah, it's it's sacrilege, you know, if you go into a business and you go, all right, so this is my idea. We're going to do this. We're going to, you know, this this documentary and stuff. But if it goes wrong, we're going to do this and that. Nobody's going to listen to that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so interesting. You, you really need, you know, one of the ways to solve that is to get a what I would call a disinterested third party mm -hmm. and, you know, get them to give you some feedback. But I, and I think this is what the professional investors, uh, certainly my experience of being CFO of small businesses, is they're brutal. 
Yeah. They, they don't they don't tolerate non-performance and they don't tolerate just not making a decision. They, they, they've, they've got a mission. Uh, they've got a, a, you know, they want one in 10 to be successful, but they also want those other nine to figure out their way. But if they can't, they're willing to make that decision. They're, they're devoid of emotion. Yeah, and it's, it's also that it's in their face. You know, most mm. of the decisions mm. that financial people are making are reflected on a daily basis that they can see. And and it, it, it may be bad information that something's going down when in fact, from a long-term perspective, it was a good, it's good investment. But sure. it's much more in your face when you're in the, in the trenches in the small business world, you are oftentimes can deny something without, you know, you're not... You can deny evidence. So I do have a, a blog post that I wrote and a, a, a presentation I give called um, Six Ways to Lose Your Money the, the six, uh, and Six Strategies to Win, the six lessons I've learned from interviewing mm -hmm. almost 800 people. It used to be 600 people. And so it was an yeah. alliteration a bit. But yeah. yeah, maybe we'll have to go on your podcast and we'll talk about that. <laughs> I'd like to do that. Yes, I'll, we can talk about failure and how and, you and, used it on this road. Yeah. So what, just, just quickly about your podcast, what should people expect if they click right now they're in, they're in Apple and they're yep. listening probably, or they're in their favorite yep. Spotify or whatever, and they click to your podcast. What are the, what's the promise there? Yeah. I think it's a genuine human connection with people who are doing remarkable things uh, in their everyday life to balance the personal uh, lifestyle, business, passion, um, and challenges associated with with the combination of the, all those three things, uh, and the courage that they have shown in that journey, and the insights that they're willing to share. I mean, nobody has to share the insights of when we failed, right? I mean, that that they can be very personal, they can be very hurtful, they can have long term scars, but the willingness of people just to engage in a way that allows others to learn from those insights is what gets me so excited about those discussions. Yeah. We have so much in common in what we're doing. And, um, mm. but mm. what I always say about my podcast, when I talk to people, I said, if there's one word that you can say, this is it's authenticity. Yeah. You know, because, and for me, yeah. the podcast is not about Chris Kendall. The podcast is a, a platform for my guests to talk about, their story loud and proud in a way that helps others. And if I can deliver that, then that's the only reward I need. Yeah, that's beautiful. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll have a link in the, in the show notes, just go, or just go right now to the anti-failure podcast. All right. Last question, Chris, what is your number one goal for the next 12 months? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very lucky. I get to live my three passions every day. I love small business. I love working with small business owners. I love working with people who care and who turn up and give their best. And most importantly, I love helping clients get the best information that they need to run their business. And if I can do those three things and keep doing it as best I can for the next 12 months, it'll be a great 12 months. Wonderful. Well, listeners, there you have it, another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. As we conclude, Chris, I want to thank you again for joining the mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? No, back yourself, have the courage, turn up and give your best. That's it. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.